Hi, greetings. Welcome, friends and comrades. Daniel Tut here with Jensen Souther. Souther, sorry. Uh, welcome, Jensen. Uh, great to have you. Um, Jensen's coming at us from uh, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, you guys got a lot of snow on the ground, or is it very warm there? Yeah, it's pretty much cleared up now, but it's still quite cold. So mm -hmm. Wonderful. So, yeah, so the kind of Twitter... Uh, and online social media space has been um, up in arms over a recent, I guess, attempt to take down Slavoj Žižek by Gabriel Rockhill in Counterpunch um, that came out kind of around the new year. And this article was coming at a, coming from the perspective of somebody who uh, was sort of trained in French theory, studied with Žižek. I think I think Rockhill published a book with Žižek. And now he is on a kind of mission to expose what he calls the sort of uh, critical theory industrial complex, which he thinks has a prehistory of complicity with the U.S. State Department and with the CIA and all this crazy stuff. So we do not want to offer the same type of critique today. Um, the reason I wanted to bring Jensen on, he's a specialist in Hegel. Not so much a specialist in Lacan, although he's writing a book right now called Spirit Disfigured uh, on the contemporary novel and the influence of Lacanian Marxism. Um, Jensen's also actually recently been selected as a Harvard Society Fellow, which you can tell us more about. That's very cool. Uh, he finished his PhD with Martin Hagland at, at Yale, um, and he is a Hegelian and a Marxist as really... Um, put forward some interesting stuff on Twitter, which compelled me to invite him. And um, I, because just putting my cards on the table, uh, I think that the Lacanian fusion with Marxism needs to be put under scrutiny. And there have, in fact, been a lot. I mean, <laughs> we should always remember that someone like Deleuze and Guattari were kind of doing the same thing in the 60s and early 70s with anti-Oedipus in the sense that they were assaulting Lacanianism. They were assaulting Lacan's teachings. Uh, but I would say they were doing so in a kind of parasitical fashion. Uh, they were trained by Lacan. So they saw Lacan in the same way that Alain Badiou sees Lacan, which is a figure of a, a sort of um, unprecedented mastery uh, one of the finest readers of Freud uh, in the post-war period, uh, who who has to be worked through all the way, right? And Badiou says, um, any philo be, uh, to paraphrase Alain Badiou, he says, any philosopher working today, if they do not have the courage to work through Lacan, Lacan's anti-philosophy, they should not call themselves a philosopher. <laughs> so Jensen is working through Lacan right now. Um, so yeah, so with that little opening, let me just kick it over to you. Um, tell us sort of what you did your dissertation in and what you, just what you're studying right now a little bit. Uh, I, I gave just a too, too brief of a snapshot. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for having me on, uh, Daniel. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to, to talk with you about, um, yeah, the Lacanian legacy for Marxism. Um, so my dissertation was on the modernist novel, but uh, by way of a serious engagement with Hegel and Marx, and particularly um, taking the sort of... Uh, uh, reading of Hegel that um, was really pioneered by, you know, Robert Pippin in the 80s and uh, trying to work through and radicalize um, Pippin's project and to bring that to bear on um, Marxist theory and to use that framework um, to reconsider the modernist novel as uh, basically the most profound expression of the crisis of rational agency in capitalist modernity. And that's the sort of um, broad picture. Um, but after I finished the dissertation and started revising the book um, 
you know, to, to publish it. Um, I realized that one of the things that I needed to do was um, I really needed to deepen my engagement with Friedrich Jameson, first of all, um, since, I mean, I, I don't think it's controversial to say that uh, in the Anglophone world that there is no more influential Marxist uh, thinker for literary criticism. And part of what Jameson tried to do was to really synthesize uh, the Frankfurt School and certain tendencies in post-structuralism. But more specifically, what Jameson tried to do was, in the context of literary theory, also what Zizek was trying to do in 1989 with the sublime object of ideology, which is to say Jameson wanted to bring back and revitalize Hegelian Marxism but by way of Lacan. So Jameson's first big book on this was The Prison House of Language. Um, then a number of years later, uh, he published a, an influential article called um, The Imaginary and Symbolic in Lacan, which is sort of a programmatic piece um, about the kind of uh, the kind of materialism that you get in Lacan and the kind of materialism that you get in Marx and how both of these really require one another. So um, what I've been doing over the past several months and what I'm uh, trying to do for the book is um, to take up a number of these sort of Lacanian strands, working with um, Todd McGowan's recent book on Hegel, uh, Emancipation After Hegel, um, Zizek's work. Uh, Zizek has had a big engagement recently with um, not just Robert Pippin, which has been a, a long, a long going sort of debate between them, but he's also got work now on Robert Brandom. He's just come out with a critique of Sebastian Ruddle uh, in this book with Frank Rudda. So I've been going through and, and um, yeah, working through these different strands of Lacanianism and trying to engage the Lacanian Marxist tradition on a literary critical, sort of a political and a philosophical level. Um, since that's what I sort of think is, is required. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, I think it's the most, uh, uh, it's a very, very important attempt to revitalize Hegelian Marxism, but I also think that it's um, uh, deeply, deeply flawed mm -hmm. into that. But that's yeah. sort of the cool. broad picture. Cool. That's great. Um, so Lacanian Marxism is always oxymoronic in part because just as folks should know if they don't know um lacan's uh lacan was always a provocateur to the marxists he was always an outsider um althusser brought lacan into his school famously when he uh, was barred from the wider international psychoanalytic societies and therefore um it's always been a question about Lacan's ambiguous commitment to the emancipatory or to the radical tradition. Uh, famously, Lacan says to the 68 students that basically they're desirous of a new master for which uh, capitalism is basically uh, not going to give them one. So they're kind of caught in a kind of interminable perversion in some ways. And it's no shock that someone like Zizek has a similar, what I, what I think at times, could be a kind of philosophical pessimism, which he inherits from Lacan in some ways. And you refer to it on Twitter, at least, as a Hegelian notion of unhappy consciousness. And so maybe we could start but with you unpacking what is unhappy consciousness for Hegel, for folks that haven't read the phenomenology, and why you think that applies to Lacanian, Lacanian thought. Yeah, great. Um, right. So just to give a, a basic sense of what's happening um, in the phenomenology that gives rise to the unhappy consciousness. Uh, famously, we have this um, struggle to the death uh, between two self-conscious subjects. This is the master-slave dialectic, which was very, very important um, for Lacan. Uh, and um, Ultimately, this battle to the death resolves itself by one subject yielding to the other, one becoming a master, the other becoming a slave. And um, after this chapter, 
uh, Hegel gives a peculiar analysis of, of three forms of consciousness, stoicism, skepticism, and then finally, the unhappy consciousness. Um, these three sort of paradigms are uh, one way to understand what Hegel is after is that these are, these are three ways of failing to deal with the outcome of the master-slave dialectic. There are three ways of sustaining the unfree condition that the master-slave dialectic engenders. So one might think of them as sort of ideological forms. You know, Hegel says, for instance, that stoicism as a philosophical idea could only arise in a moment of universal enslavement, for instance. Um, and without getting into the particulars of what uh, skepticism and stoicism involve, um, in effect, uh, in the skeptical model, you have a subject that, you know, sort of in keeping with the classical or the, the ancient model of skepticism, um, who doubts the sort of verticality of all their perceptions, but also um, they're skeptical of any belief or commitment that they might hold. So the, the aim is, is basically to void oneself of all beliefs and commitments. Um, but as Hegel points out, this uh, gives rise to a problem. So on the one hand, the skeptic is um, trying to attain this state of ataraxy by overcoming all belief so that they can attain a state of peace or tranquility. Because um, if you believe in anything, that incites the emotions that you know makes you want things, makes you want to do things. So thinking of like sextus, sextus empiricus, for example, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. And but Hegel says that well, there's a problem here because on the one hand you have this skeptic who has to go and like eat food and drink water, and he has to have beliefs about what you know water is and what food is. So you have this empirical side of the skeptic that has to go and do these things. But then on the other hand, they have this universalist belief that the skeptical position is the right belief and that we should, we, one ought to give up all of one's beliefs. So this is the dilemma that we're left with at the end of skepticism. And Hegel sort of shows that when the skeptic comes to realize this, this divided nature, that they embody, this is what gives rise to the phenomenon of the unhappy consciousness. So in the unhappy consciousness, you have a subject that is essentially torn between their everyday empirical self, their embodiment, their particularity, their idiosyncrasies, etc., and some notion of a universal standpoint that is unreachable. And Hegel calls this uh, the changeable, the body, me, you know, the individual, and the unchangeable. And classically, you know, the sort of examples that Hegel gives of this are things like, you know, divinity, different notions of, of godhood, um, you know, different notions of uh, sort of absolute authority, or different notions of um, mastery, uh, which um, I'm asymmetrically dependent on. So, Hegel thinks that the unhappy consciousness is sort of a, uh, I'm always striving to attain to a universalist standpoint that I also know that I can never achieve. And that's the basis for the unhappiness. So I can see what would constitute the standpoint of satisfaction, but I can only approach it asymptotically, as it were. I can never actually realize it. And this basic model of lack uh, constitutes the very being of um, the un unhappy subject. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the basic yeah. Hegelian picture. Mm -hmm. Helpful. That's helpful. Yeah. So one could naturally uh, see how Lacanianism fits into such a conception. I mean, one could even possibly invoke Lacan's Jansenist catholic conception of uh well, position uh, which which could be interpreted uh through the notion of the um uh, you know the the emphasis on the lacking subject the emphasis on this kind of um, incompleteness the skepticism towards 
the universal, but at the same time that that is present in Lacan, there's also a conversation on Hegel that he brings out in the 17th seminar that he offered called The Other Side of Psychoanalysis, where he says that Hegel um, helps us to address a problem with the Enlightenment. And he references Diderot's uh, Remo's nephew, which is an interesting reference because uh, Remo's nephew is about um, the incompleteness of Enlightenment knowledge as such, right? Because it sort of stages a drama in which a, pro a, a supposedly wise or learned person is dealing with a pupil for whom that pupil refuses the uh, universalism implicit in the knowledge that they're trying to transmit to the pupil. And right. that refusal is something obviously that I've mentioned on our show before. It's in so interesting to me as a, as somebody that teaches philosophy because, or even like, let's say you go back home to friends you went to high school with who don't give a shit about intellectual ideas. That's the first thing you're going to get is like, this is all hot air in some sense. Sure. Yeah. But Lacan says that Hegel helps us with that issue um, by, by providing a certain, um, and he makes a funny neologism of we must uh, regale or Hegel, Hegel, regale ourselves with Hegel because yeah. Hegel assists, uh, Hegel, Hegel's uh, discourse understands something about the crisis of enlightenment, absolute knowledge as such. Um, and that's kind of where the dialectical part begins. So, so when we say that um, we should probably talk about Lacan's own reading of Hegel, and I know yeah. that, you know, it's deeply informed by someone like Alexandre Kojev, the Russian emigre who gave the famous lectures on the phenomenology for which Lacan was in attendance. Um, and I know that Kojev's Hegel is super problematic for you. So maybe before we get to Lacan's Hegel, can we start with Kojev's Hegel? Um, he published uh, these lectures which I think everybody should read them. They're extremely important document of the 20th century. Um, influence Leo Strauss, they've influenced uh, Heidegger, I think as well, right? They influenced Lacan, they influenced the post-war pantheon of important kind of philosophers in some sense. But you, you maintain that Kojev's Hegel is deeply flawed and deeply problematic. So I don't know if this is a good time to sort of throw that onto the table as background for our listeners a little bit. Um, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that the the sort of common, uh, well, first, I think that the radical thing about Kojev's Hegel is that Kojev's he Hegel is is already sort of pointing in, um, you know, a Marxian direction. And Kojev is thinking about this, uh, you know, with, from from within the the sort of horizon of of Marxism and the possibility of you know uh, some kind of um, uh, emancipation beyond capitalism and that's very valuable but I think that there's also you know the the common criticism at least is that there's an anthropo anthropologizing tendency in Kojev's reading where uh, you know the basic sort of problem of the philosophy of history in Hegel and the basic sort of historical movement really becomes about, um, you know, uh, the human species. It really becomes about, um, you know, an almost uh, quasi empirical confrontation between, um, you know, masters and slaves. And what's lost is uh, what people like Pippin, for instance, have, have highlighted is um, from the logical perspective, the problem of, you know, um, conceptual determinacy, intelligibility, sense making. Um, and from the phenomenological perspective, uh, really the problem of, um, you know, rationality and the sorts of uh, reasons that not just, you know, we finite human agents could sustain, um, but that any finite being, you know, any sort of rational animal um, could actually sustain. So it becomes about, 
uh, rationality as such and what it means to be a reason giver and what you know our history teaches us about the very notion of reason itself mm. and this is what disappears um, in the Kojevian picture um, and I think also uh, deprives sort of the Hegelian project of some of its most powerful uh, philosophical and critical resources. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. even though, you know, Robert Pippin, Brandom, this school of people, they're not, you know, they don't identify as Marxists. They don't identify particularly as, uh, you know, revolutionaries or radicals. I mean, they're, they're mostly liberals. Mm -hmm. But the, the argument, at least, is that the philosophical resources that they've excavated are, mm -hmm. um, you know, they completely outstrip whatever you know private political positions mm -hmm. they might absolutely have. absolutely yeah i mean why else would we read reactionary thinkers if they didn't although although there is there is at the same time um limits to that pro proposition like you know if you take someone like like carl schmidt or something like this like there are limits to um if if a concept from a philosopher is designed uh, in its function to further a reactionary like there there are limits to to this notion but but otherwise yeah why would we study uh people outside of marxism i think that's actually interesting apropos kojev because a big thing that jean-claude milner a student of lacan in his uh recently translated work called the clear of of lacan the clear work mm -hmm. of lacan he says that Lacan turned to Saussurian structural linguistics in part as an attempt to move away from Stalinist linguistics at the time, because as you know, the ABCs of Lacanianism's understanding of the symbolic order is through a Saussurian linguistic structure of a kind of um, metonymic differential structure, uh, understanding of desire in which um, there is no um, stable uh, a conception of the ego. In fact, uh, the whole tradition of ego psychology was producing a quite uh, aggressive uh, uh, version of the subject, right? Which is forcing the subject to adapt to capitalist imperatives. And then, of course, the point there is that the same was happening in the Soviet Union. So you were kind of trying to think something which was very mercurial at the time of the Cold War, because you had two uh, systems, which in some sense both had to be rejected. Yeah. Right? Um, so we should always situate Lacan as a kind of, and that's also why Milner says that he moved away from Kojev, and therefore he moved away also in sense from Hegel. In other words, if Kojev is the master of Hegel for, for Lacan, and I think it's true that he is, um, Lacan doesn't have another Hegel to turn to in some sense. Yeah, right, moves, right. So his philosophical foundation kind of moves away from Kojevian because of Kojev's Stalinist associations in some ways. Right. Possibly. Um, but nonetheless, the whole conception of Lacan's mirror stage, his idea of the imaginary, his early work in the late 30s and 40s is, is, is so deeply influenced by Kojev's understanding of the master-slave dialectic. And the, the main thing there is the notion that and this is interesting apropos Marxism, is that capitalism um, in forcing an adaptation to its system produces an interior unhappiness. So the unhappy consciousness in some sense is a result of, one, one charitable reading of Lacan, is a result of adaptive, adaptative processes. But then the problem with that, in my opinion, and I know you may agree, is that that then leads a very interesting presupposition or, or claim that proletarianization affects everyone alike. Yeah. Um, and then later Lacan will develop what he calls the theory of the discourses. And he has um, the master's discourse, which is the or original discourse, the uh, discourse of the hysteric, which he actually locates with Socrates, with philosophy. Um, then you have the... Um, uh, the discourse of the university, which is the discourse for which Hegel was rivaling, the discourse in which the Enlightenment is developed and so on, which he actually says starts with Charlemagne. 
And then you have uh, the discourse of the analyst, which starts with Freud. And, but then he says there's a fifth discourse, the capitalist discourse, but it is so deleterious that it uh, threatens to override the entirety of the uh, four. And so then you get from that a lot of Marxists who, who basically understand and understand class, ideology, and all the central categories of Marxism through a theory of the discourses. Right. And so that's, to me, the, um, uh, the big question for Lacan, or one of the big questions, which is, what do we think about the discourse theory? Is it problematic? And if so, how is it problematic? Um, and I wonder yeah. what you might think about that. Well, I think that the, uh, thanks for that. It's really helpful. And it's really helpful, um, recapitulation of, the uh, the schema of the four discourses. Um, yeah, because they are historically or, uh, even though Lacan is opposed to historicism, he yeah. does say that they have historical origin point. Okay. So, well, maybe the best way to sort of, uh, get at the problem is, I mean, maybe this will be too crude and you can, you know, uh, correct me. Um, but in some sense, I think that uh, the chief defect goes back to the fundamental theory of um, social assimilation or individuation on the Lacanian picture, mm. which has to do with the castration mm. model. And as I understand it, the castration picture, it, it undergirds the discourses as well. It's mm -hmm. at play and, you know, the, the uh, most foundational Lacanian understanding of subject formation, um, which is to say that, um, you know, when one is uh, initiated into a language as a child, um, that this uh, uh, that this process engenders or consists in this form of fundamental repression. Um, and that's the price that one pays for social assimilation. So one, um, and Lacan often frames this in terms of like a, a, a constitutive tension between need and demand, mm -hmm. um, which again, being crude for a moment, we might say that um, you know, there's a constitutive tension between something like uh, uh, biological need and normative demand that is inescapable for us. And this produces the phenomenon of desire mm -hmm. and the drives mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that this picture of um, castration as the basis of mm -hmm. individuation um, that seems to structurally commit us to an understanding of sociality mm -hmm. in terms of what Lacan calls the big other. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where I think that it becomes very hard to distinguish if one takes that as sort of the, the I mean, I know that, that Lacan is often also represented as a anti-philosopher mm -hmm. and this is you know, he moves away from this idea of, um, you know, truth, so to speak, uh, that psychoanalysis has, has a different object. Um, but I do think that, you know, the, the Derridian point against Lacan that, well, Lacan does have a notion of truth and that notion of truth is castration. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think that there is a certain, you know, um, correctness to that thought. And if we follow it through, um, we get a model of castration plus big otherness mm -hmm. and that that commits us to an idea of the unhappy consciousness as ontological, as just constitutive of who we are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a provocation. I've just yeah, yeah, that yeah. out there, but no, that's the basic idea. No, I think, I think that's, I think that's a helpful, um, point of view. Again, in a curious way, you know, Jensen, it does bring us back to 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 Lacan's students in the 60s and 70s when they opened up uh, the experimental uh, parasite of Vincennes, where Lacan gave his uh, seminars to to students who were um, anarchists and Marxists themselves and Deleuze and Guattari and Lyotard and all of those 
French Maoists were uh, a part of it. So in some sense, it starts with French Maoism and um, La Ange, the angel. It's incredibly interesting and strange. It hasn't been translated yet. Um, book that came out of this by Guy Ledru and Christian Jambet, two uh, both both very very militant um, Maoist readers of Lacan that took um, Lacan's notions. Because you see, I think one helpful argument I would say is that Lacan's trying to theorize a a, a sort of historical transmutation of the Freudian Oedipus complex, right? And this Good. is this is why Lacan has this um, provocative, one of the reasons why he has a provocative relationship to the IPA, the International Psychoanalytic Association, because he thinks that moder modernity um, isn't producing a subjectivity which is capable of rivaling the Freudian truths in some sense. So uh, in that sense, you can see why uh, there's a sort of a, a definite paradox at work in Lacan and paradox. What I mean by that is that he's trying to um, say something about uh, the profound subjective courage that's required to face up to the truths of castration, while at the same time understanding and giving hints for how to transcend such a predicament, which is why ultimately um, subjectivization or a kind of passageway through for Lacan, the end of analysis, right? What does it mean to be cured in psychoanalysis? Uh, uh, results in what he calls a love of weakness, a love of weakness, which is um, a kind of recognition of one's own cast castration in some sense. And so um, I, I try to put Lacan into dialogue with uh, a post-war consumerist capitalist society in which the limitations of Lacan's critique of capitalism, in my opinion, revolve a, a lot of a lot of it is around a distinction that Samo Tomschik makes between two types of alienation in Marx. Samo says in his book on um, Marx and Lacan, there's constituted alienation, which is that which is uh, phenomenological vis-a-vis -vis, uh, commodity fetishism, which is very like Zizekian, uh, which is where Zizek tries to create his new theory of ideology, um, which it is itself, let's say, affects all subjects. Hmm? Then there is constitutive alienation, which is the alienation that Marx spoke about and Lukács spoke about, which is the alienation vis-a-vis -vis labor power. Those two types of alienation, I think Lacan says a lot to number one, but less to number two. Sure. Yeah. Be because it's unacceptable, in my opinion, to for Marxism to say that we're all proletarians. It just it's it's uh, it's it's a bourgeoisification of the whole cap category of class, and it's offensive, in my opinion. Right. I mean, it <laughs> it's it's so it's so uninterested with the realities of labor. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's 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 harmful to to put that forward, because then it leads to a kind of beautiful soul politics, I would say, yeah. in which, um, yeah, we share this. Well, it's actually not beautiful soul. It's more romantic reformer. Um, I don't know if you know the the, the there's a great Hegelian um, Wilfred Verecke, and he points out in Hegel's phenomenology. We always talk about beautiful soul, but he thinks the more interesting category is the romantic reformer who. Mm -hmm who abides by the law of the heart for themselves and tries to transpose that onto the social field as if we're all alienated in the same way that I, that dynamic, which of course, if you say that on the left can create a lot of problems. Yeah. Right. Because like take, take, for example, uh, the critiques against family abolition on the right, which I think are very disingenuous. So they say, Oh, you're for family abolition. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must have had such a terrible family. Right, right. <laughs> We're super disingenuous, right? Yeah, yeah, but, of course, of course. But, but but I think you're onto something about the very notion that Lacanianism gives us this sense in which, yeah, we're all alienated one in the same. And I wonder if you could say something about that. Like, what's your what's your thought? Yeah, that? so there's a, there's a tangle of issues here that... Uh, yeah, maybe it would it would help me at least to kind of dissect a bit further. That's a really helpful um, sort of overview of the uh, those two forms of of alienation, and maybe to 
put a finer point on that distinction. Um, yeah, I would say that that in Hegel in particular, you got a uh, super refined theory of the distinction between um, externalization and alienation, where externalization is, um, you know, the fact that to be an agent at all, to, to be a subject, you have to um, externalize your beliefs and commitments in um, embodied acts that uh, in some way are um, uh, always in excess of you. So, you know, to be a teacher or whatever, that requires doing the things that a teacher does. But in doing the things that a teacher does, you're always liable to um, betray yourself or undermine yourself or, you know, entering into the, the space of contingency is that's not itself contingent. That's necessary. That's constitutive of being an agent. That's externalization. Um, but alienation, that consists in uh, these same kinds of embodied acts that produce um, practices, institutions, and structures in which we cannot see ourselves and which appear to us as imposed on us from the outside and not by ourselves. And that's what we get with the basic dynamic of capital, um, the sort of objectification of, you know, um, our social relations in uh, the form of, you know, constant capital and industrial technology and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that, that this distinction between externalization, which is constitutive, ontological, necessary to be an agent, and then alienation, which is uh, arguably in some sense specific to um, capitalist modernity, although there's always been some form of dissatisfaction, which we might want to taxonomize in different ways, depending on what sort of historical moment we're looking at. I mean, Robert Brandom, for instance, makes a distinction between um, fetishism, which he identifies with the ancient world, and alienation, which he identifies with modernity. And while one can sort of make some complaints about exactly how he cashes that out, I still think that there's something valuable about that kind of taxonomization of forms of dissatisfaction uh, in order to pinpoint what's specific about modernity. Yeah. Now, just to say one, one more thing to get to your question about proletarianization. Um, I would say that, you know, I completely agree with you that it's egregious to claim that under capitalism, we're all proletarianized because, I mean, that that effectively trivializes the very you know, idea of um, class theory. Um, you know, we're, we're all then just proletariats and you get no sense of the actual class distinction, you know, driving the, the forms of domination. However, what I would say is that while we are not all proletarianized, we are all dominated by capital. And that means that the bourgeoisie and the capitalists are also alienated. They are also subject to processes of domination. It's a huge mistake to think that, you know, the capitalists or the bourgeoisie are living free, unalienated lives, mm -hmm. whereas the workers are living, you know, alienated lives. Mm -hmm. No, because we want to say that even if all the workers became bourgeoisie and capitalists, they would still be unfree. Mm -hmm. It's not as if, you know, that's the answer, mm -hmm. you know, to all become the, the sort of, you know, family members in succession or whatever, and then we would be free. Right. No, we see exactly in a series like that, like that's what <laughs> freedom looks like for, yeah. you know, the upper echelons of society. It's not that's free at all. That's a very great point. That's a very great um, point. But, and then the final point I would make is that uh, we need to, to distinguish that conception, a sort of his, historical notion and a historically impoverished notion of proletarianization where everyone under capitalist society is proletarianized. That's clearly wrong. Um, but there's another idea, which is an ontological notion of proletarianization. And this is what I've seen in some of the Lacanian discourse, like in David uh, Guiar, mm -hmm. who argues, for instance, that um, initiation into language as such, mm -hmm. you know, castration as such, mm -hmm. that this is a universally proletarianizing phenomenon, that we are all 
you know, bound up in this process of, uh, you know, um, what Zizek called surplus enjoyment or mm -hmm. producing for the sake of mm -hmm. uh, the other. And that's just constitutive mm -hmm. of being an agent in intersubjective relations. Mm -hmm. And that is what I want to say is the bad ontologization mm -hmm. of, and, and to put a, to, to sort of bring this home, Quiar even says that like, well, uh, yeah, the problem with, you know, a lot of the Marxist discourse is that they want to uh, historicize mm -hmm. Lacanianism, whereas what we actually need to do is transcendentalize the Marxist account of capitalism, because really what the Marxist account of capitalism is getting at is a sort of fundamental ontological structure that has to do with the very form of social assimilation, institutionalization, etc., and one gets a version of this too in like in Zizek, when in Sublime Object, Zizek says, well, there's always been a problem in Marxism with ultra historicization. Mm -hmm. But what about, you know, the Lacanian point that, you know, perversion, castration complex, these things can't be historicized in that way because they're the very condition for any kind of historical process or mm -hmm. subjectivation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, you get the point. That's yeah. the... Yeah. yeah, this is what David... Pavon Koya, who's been on our program before and who is um, a very, very interesting, uh, uh, based in Mexico, uh, Lacanian psychoanalyst and, and uh, political thinker, um, committed to a, a type of Trotskyist Marxism, by the way. Um, so Lacan, Lacanianism also has a touchstone point with Trotskyism. I mean, Lacanianism has a touchstone point with um, a whole field of leftist thought, right? Most Lacanians right now, I mean, this is inter interesting, this great category that Lukács developed, what he calls uh, romantic anti-capitalism. Yeah. And my feeling is that when you have this notion of the capitalist discourse in Lacanianism, where it's this notion of a universal in itself condition of um, constituted alienation, which you recognize has a merit, a grain of truth. I think the problem with it within the psychoanalytic community is that you then get a sense in which, and Lacan poses this himself, I think in, in his lecture television, where only the, the it, it's interesting, it gives a, it arrogates a certain authority to this psychoanalyst to, to, to combat the deleterious effects of the discourse of the capitalist. What is the problem with the discourse of the capitalist? The problem is, is that the in, in general, and we could throw up the math theme and so on, but it's very pretty simple. The basic problem is, is that um, capitalism seeks to resolve the split subjectivity of the of the subject through the commodity. And in that sense, doesn't facilitate a proper working through of that split subjectivity, as does psychoanalysis. So in a way, what you could say is that psychoanalysis, and here I mean psychoanalysis as an institution of therapy, right? For let's say the working class becomes the only, or one of the main uh, me methods for overcoming this, this constitutive alienation that we all find ourselves in. But the problem with that in practice is that as we know, psychoanalysis as a practice is predominantly secluded, especially in America to bourgeois classes, right? So my position on that is like, okay, if you want to do free clinics and like really preach the gospel of psychoanalysis vis-a-vis -vis therapy, let's do it. That's one fabulous tactic for socialist politics. So I actually don't think that that's disputable because I put a great trust in the psychoanalytic process, right? Right. As, as a means for uh, addressing the unsatisfied desire of subjects in capitalism, which, 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 sure, we can supplement our understanding of psychoanalysis with greater socialistic and Marxist um, theory, which it needs, right? But that doesn't take away from the um, importance of the psychoanalytic cure, in in my in my opinion. Now, someone like Alain Badiou would disagree with that. For him, he says, "I've never done psychoanalysis." I've learned insights for uh, philosophy through Lacan, but he thinks that political organiz organizing can be like its own um, form of psychoanalytic therapy in a way. <laughs> Just kind of interesting idea. Um, so I wonder what right. you think about that. Like, I don't know if you've read this book um, called Freud's Free Clinics, which looks at like Red Vienna, yeah. 
after World War I, where basically Freud allowed, in partnership with the social uh, democracy uh, governments, because, uh, you know, the war ended and like, you know, the aristocracy is done and now we're um, and Bolshevism is just like right next door. Right. So, yeah. so so Vienna was faced with the question of do we participate in the dictatorship of the proletariat? And there's this incredible argument from Etienne Balibar where he goes back and he shows that Freud, as a Jewish uh, scientist, was facing immense pressure by the German intelligentsia to not um, put forward a theory of psychoanalysis, which would be at all supportive uh, or sympathetic to Bolshevism. And he shows that uh, in Freud's debates with Hans Kelsen, a conservative liberal jurist, that's where Freud developed his possibly reactionary notion of superego as a way to push against Bolshevik dictatorship of proletariat. To me, this is an incredible insight, which is insane, but because it shows that psychoanalysis itself is a weapon in the class struggle, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So I wonder if you if you agree with that and if you think that like there is a place for psychoanalysis in 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 socialist struggle. Yeah, I, I have. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I, I have complicated feelings about it. Um, for one you know, not to harp on my earlier point, but I do think that, um, yeah, on the one hand, before one can sort of even begin to address that question, I think there's this sort of residual issue of um, what the kind of metaphysical or ontological presuppositions of the analytic paradigm are. And, you know, that is again where, you know, I would question the sort of uh, castration lack model, depending on how that's understood. If that's understood as a historically specific, you know, configuration of subjectivity, which is the argument that someone like Juliet Mitchell makes, um, or if it's understood as ontologically constitutive of what it is to be an agent, which I think is what Zizek and arguably Lacan, that they're serving up some form of that. But to hold that to one side, um, Basically, I agree with you that the the psychoanalytic uh, model of therapy is essential to helping to rehabituate and to reintegrate, you know, sort of the the uh, psyches of rational subjects, and that there's no question that that kind of work is necessary. I mean, I I follow. Jonathan Lear and Alistair McIntyre. McIntyre has a really fantastic short book that's not one of his more well-known books. It's just called The Unconscious. And, you know, he tries to more or less show that the category of the unconscious is, is necessary, that we do require it. And the Aristotelian notion of habituation, which is really about, um, you know, uh, yeah, what it would take to... Uh, produce um, autonomous individuals uh, capable of acting on reasons that, uh, you know, they take to be satisfying. Um, you know, McIntyre says that the psychoanalytic, you know, model of therapy is it's necessary, uh, actually, for completing the old Aristotelian notion of virtue. And I think Lear is after something similar in his synthesis of Aristotle and Freud. And as we all know, you know, I mean, Hegel's, you know, two most important predecessor figures are Kant and Aristotle. And Hegel is also after, you know, um, some notion of uh, sort of Aristotelian habituation in the way that he wants to think about mm -hmm. um, ra a rational process of individuation. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, structurally speaking, it's it's absolutely crucial to having the right model of social assimilation. But then comes, I guess, third, the political part of the puzzle and how psychoanalysis relates to the socialist project. And mm -hmm. that is where, um, you know, I mean, uh, to sort of uh, this isn't maybe entirely fair to what Adorno is trying to do, but um, in Adorno's work on 
um, psychology and sociology, I mean, he sort of says that like, well, you know, these two discourses are completely torn mm -hmm. and opposed to one another because the individual and, and society are torn and opposed to each other. And there's a certain sense in which, you know, ego psychology is, uh, it's always going to be conformist under capitalist conditions. Mm -hmm. And there is no real way to uh, emphasize, you know, psychoanalytic therapy without sort of, um, uh, you know, aiding and abetting the capitalist process of, of reproduction. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a certain truth to that. Yeah. So that's true as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, especially if you look like Lacan gave a um, <clears throat> really interesting lecture once um, called British Psychiatry and the War, where it was where he argued that the psychoanalyst Wilfred Bion is one of the main reasons why the British beat the Nazis. Because why? Because Bion's group psychology trained uh, the men in in their um, units, cadres, etc., to to work more cohesively together, precisely dealing with the traumatic insights into war that Freud develops from his own analyses of World War One traumatized subjects, soldiers. And that even in beyond the pleasure principle, right? So, so I've always thought that was interesting. And then, of course, there's all yeah. this literature on Nazism and psych. So, psychoanalysis is not, uh, psych like uh, <laughs> somebody was telling me recently. If you ever wish to convince like somebody in the military uh, who thinks that psychoanalysis is kind of like I don't know some stupid or like um, uh, degraded approach to therapy, or even if they think that therapy itself is, I don't know, like I, I come from, um, my brother is in the military, for example, and he holds these views. Somebody told me, well, just tell them how much the military has used the insights of psychoanalysis. <laughs> right, um, right. So right. That, that's a fact, right? So, so in that sense, yeah, like, uh, we can have the debate on the scientific basis of psychoanalysis, which I'm not really interested in, at least as understood from Popper's position. I'm not interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but uh, uh, I think what I am interested in is the question of psychoanalysis as a means for um, breaking from this more constitutive form of alienation, which I think we both agree is real and does does exist, but needs to be needs to be supplemented with um, constituted alienation vis-a-vis -vis labor power and the um, the way, like, because of course in the Republican tradition of like. Um, uh, that, that's very popular right now, where everyone says, well, Marx's theory, theory of alienation has to do with impersonal domination, right? Um, you see this in William Clare Roberts, Marx's Inferno, and all of these folks. And I think that that's a really cool wager that, you know, as a Marxist, we can kind of say that the unrealizable contradictions of bourgeois liberal society um, cannot be borne out, cannot be realized because of this condition of, of, um, constituted alienation and impersonal domination which which we all suffer alike um but i think that the question for lacan that you you're raising is that um he tries to possibly ontologize that into a theory of language and you have a problem with that i will say though on that point you know lacan was once asked um is your theory of the unconscious is the unconscious going to be understood as an ont ontological structure or domain? And he said, no, uh, it must be understood as an ethical structure, which is very interesting contrast. What he means by that is that the unconscious is dependent on existing social conditions, right? In a sense, it's a kind of um, receptacle in which the subject relates to those contradict or those social conditions through non-contradiction. Which means an interesting point that actually, if you read Lacan from Marxist lens, actually what that you could say is that the unconscious is a reactionary formation. If it is a reflection of the of the social of uh, uh, of socialization, yeah. Um, so then, therefore, I guess it really matters the direction of the treatment, right? And and that's why Lacan is used by Marxists because the direction of his treatment 
is not towards further adaptation. If it was, then nobody in the, on the left would really care about Lacan, right? So Lacan has different reasons for moving away from adaptation than we do, yeah, right? right? But I think that that movement away from adaptation is that there's something correct about that, perhaps, to be charitable to Lacan. Um, yeah. So, you know, and, and then, of course, he also said, and I'll, I'll stop there. And we also have questions coming, and I'm going to get to these in a second. But I don't know if you wanted to, to jump in. Yeah, I'll just say something there. I mean, you also get this. Uh, this was an old, you know, uh, debate among the Anglophone Hegelians about whether Hegel's project is metaphysical or non-metaphysical, mm. you know uh or ontological or non-ontological however you want to put it i mean I, I think this is a poorly framed way of uh accounting for what the sort of content of the debate is but um one way that one often hears about this is that like you know for a long time robert pippin would say things like well you know self-conscious agency it's it's a it's a norm it's an achievement it's a practical achievement it's not an ontological status you don't you know have agency in the same way that, you know, you have certain properties or, you know, it's something that you have to do. And, uh, you know, I think that's a false opposition as if it's, you know, either a property or, you know, it's a sort of pragmatic achievement. The real point is that, you know, self-consciousness is the very form mm -hmm. of the kinds of beings that we are. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's absolutely metaphysical because you can't make sense of what an agent is without that notion. So, you know, I guess the question is for the Lacanian position and, you know, I'm sure that Lacan's actual thought is complex on this point and he says different things, but in terms of Lacanianism mm -hmm. and the legacy of Lacan, especially mm -hmm. as it's taken up by someone like Zizek, who I think, you know, has really um, uh, systematized uh, in many ways the, the most fundamental um, you know, sort of formulations of Lacanianism. I mean, there you do get something like, uh, you know, I mean, Zizek wants to ground this um, in, uh, you know, an ontology of um, the gap of non-being, mm -hmm. you know, the real, um, and show that that this is fundamentally imbricated in the structure of subjectivity. Mm -hmm. And my claim again is that. Um, if one follows that line through, then one ends up with something like the unhappy consciousness picture. Mm -hmm. But I do want to say one sort of qualifying thing about that. And that's that I also think that there's a very powerful possibility for a kind of imminent critique of the Lacanian picture, which is to say that in the, uh, the text on um, the subversion of the subject, the famous text yeah. on Hegel and master slave dialectic. I mean, Lacan makes this point. Um, it's either there or or he, he makes a similar point in the early text on aggressivity. Mm -hmm. uh, but he says something to the effect that like, well, um, you know, the big other, it really would be this sort of, you know, problem if it actually existed. But, you know, it, it, it doesn't actually exist. It's, it's just us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'll say other things like, you know, well, the true father is, is the dead father, mm -hmm. because it's not about an empirical person. It's not about, you know, an individual. Mm -hmm. It's about an internalized law and dynamic and form of, you know, intersubjective relation. Mm -hmm. But this is exactly the move that one gets at the end of Hegel's own account of the unhappy consciousness, which is to say that, uh, you know, the members of the religious community in Hegel's picture that have adopted the standpoint of the unhappy consciousness, ultimately they realize that the unchangeable, the name of the father, the big other, whatever you want to call it, is actually the result and the product of their own normative, social, intersubjective, recognitive activity. Mm -hmm. And so what they begin to recognize is that, you know, they themselves are the reciprocally authorizing big others, that they themselves are responsible for the very structure of big otherness. And mm -hmm. that's then what allows them to overcome and to uh, renegotiate what it means to be in a social formation, mm -hmm. such that 
sociality would no longer be a question of, you know, a structure that stands outside of us and is imposed on us from the outside, but it's rather a matter of, you know, the reasons that we can share and the sorts of institutions for which we're responsible and, you know, that are subject to criticism and change on that basis. Mm -hmm. So I think that there is a possibility for, you know, uh, there's something very valuable about the Lacanian formulation of, you know, big otherness. But I also think that we should turn back to Hegel and use the resources that he provides to yeah. subjecting that idea to a kind of historical critique. That's very helpful. That's that's very interesting. I mean, I think one of Zizek's most important contributions to this debate is how at some point he said, look, Lacan has this notion in psycho psychoanalysis, like literally in the exchange between the analyst and the patient or what he calls the analyst and um, things that are most productive for the unconscious occur through what he calls acts, acts. And an act is um, in a sense irrational, in a sense it's making a kind of wager to pivot the um, libidinal investments that weigh down a symptom, right? Um, you can think about a symptom kind of like um, being being weighed down and that the treatment is a way to release and to, 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 to foster a kind of movement out of what is making the subject unhappy in a very simple sense. Well, Zizek says in politics, we can transpose that theory to understand and analyze um, left-wing politics or even any kind of politics. So for example, he famously says that an example of an act on the political um, horizon or situation in recent times, the last, you know, 50, 60 years was obviously Margaret Thatcher's um, shifting of the very coordinates of the, the distinction between right and left within the Western parliamentary system. This can be understood as an act in the sense that it's a movement, a way in which we now look at the distinction between right and left in completely different uh, ways. So what right. Zizek wants to put forward is a theory in which we can kind of um, re-historicize uh, uh, moments of novelty in which there is a collapse of this kind of tight libidinal structure vis-a-vis -vis an act. And that's why um, a lot of Lacanianism in its Maoist uh, revolutionary sense um, became so appealing because you can see that you, you run a risk of a kind of fetish of the, of the violent act in some sense. Right. I'm not saying that Zizek does that. I, I think his politics are super pragmatic and they're all over the place. For example, Zizek's politics in the nineties look nothing like his politics today in a practical sense. Right. Um, you can't go from championing Robespierre to the squad. In my opinion, it's like two, night and day. Um, but putting that aside, I think at the level of theory, it's kind of an interesting way of looking at things. And Bedieu, in a way, um, has the notion of event as well. Um, and, 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 and you know, Lacan says something in the 17th seminar, very interesting. He says, Marxism uh, should be understood. He says, Marxism, to paraphrase, should be understood as a gospel that seeks to, to, to destroy discourse, to destroy existing discourse. So through the theory of the discourses, he thinks that Marxism brings about destruction of bourgeois uh, discourse. Of course, he's looking at the post-1917 context in which that kind of was what happened, right? I mean, the Bolsheviks, right. the Bolsheviks used counter-public agitation, the magazines, the, the media they had available to them to, to successfully foment a revolution. So in that sense, you could sort of say it has some valid points, but um, I don't know. Like for me, I, 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 I'm very sympathetic to Jan Raymond's argument in his book on ideology, where he says that the problem with the discourse theory is actually that they're not capable of thinking um, the lived experience of the subjects that they study. And that kind of goes back to the notion of the ultra... Uh, alienated theory of subjectivity and the notion of the castration in some sense, which really needs to be kind of parceled out 
and and worked through in ways. Otherwise, you get this notion, which I think you see in Zizek, and this makes Zizek a great interlocutor with someone like Jordan Peterson, because Zizek's message in the Peterson debate was kind of like that, which is like socialist society will always reproduce envy, right? Yeah. Right. It always so so it's like this pessimist thing, right? It's like oh well, okay, well then if that's true, then why the fuck are we socialists, right? Yeah. Like really, like. No, exactly. That, exactly. That, that's yeah. my, and I'm with you on that. Like, this bothers me a lot. Like, we can't be naive utopians, but we also can't resign ourselves to say, like, oh, well, <laughs> all state socialism failed fundamentally. And if, if we say that, then we might as well say Pax Americana. We're all liberal entrepreneurs, and this is it. We're yeah. Fukuyamists, right? So, th this is my question with Zizek sometimes, you know? It's like, yeah, because otherwise you have, I mean, you, you've, you've basically, you know, at best, so what do you have, like, you know, redistributed wealth, but, you know, still the same structure of intersubjective relations where, you know, this sort of form of, because uh, I mean, there, there's a line in, in um, uh, the, the Four Fundamental Concepts book, the Lacan mm -hmm. book, where Lacan says, like, well, you know, when we think about the evil eye or, you know, these sort of mythological ideas about seeing that it, it's it's, of course, true that we never talk about the good eye. We always talk about the evil eye. And that's yeah. because the only eye that there is is the evil eye. And that structure of envy is just the basic form of, you know, intersubjective relation, because we cannot help but to see that the satisfaction that we are lacking is the satisfaction that you know someone else is mm -hmm. achieving mm -hmm. and that's just the basic form for lacan that i think again follows from if you start from the idea that entrance into sociality is already a moment of lack mm -hmm. then inevitably sociality is going to appear as big other and the small other is going to appear as an object of envy yeah and that that's the the basic sort of ontological point that I know I keep coming back to it, but I think that that's sort of the, we have to go to that route if if one wants to sort of reconfigure the picture and to think about, you know, uh, the kinds of emancipatory forms that we would want. Yeah. Uh, of course, we want to overcome, you know, that kind of constitutive envy. Mm -hmm. No, I think this is interesting. I mean, I always point out when we want to talk about constitutive initiation into language and stuff like that, I think it's always helpful. And we have a great um, reading study group on um, Beyond the Pleasure Principle. But when you look at Freud's analysis of the Fort Dog game of his grandson, it's actually a really cool thing he did. He basically said, look, I want to explain to you how the subject enters into um, speech and language by analyzing the way that I observed my grandson do so. And um, he he shows the the, the it's, it's basically uh fort is like here and then da is away so like fort here in a way is the name of the game that the son played to uh pacify his uh trauma the kind of basic trauma of the abandonment of the mother like when the mother would leave the room and the baby's in the playpen freud saw that the child started to create this game with playing with a toy would throw it away so that the child could prepare themselves for living with the absence of the mother in some sense, right? Right. And um, anyways, in Lacan's interpretation of the Fort Dog game, which we also analyze in the study group on our YouTube page, um, you kind of get a, a pretty clear sense of this um, kind of primordial castration of the constitutive basis of the early Oedipal yeah. logic itself. And like... Yeah. That actually becomes the whole schema in some sense of the crisis of psychoanalysis, because I, I try to show that Lacan was facing a version of capitalism that was actually quite different than Freud was. And Freud was facing the kind of tail end of a kind of revolutionary dissolution of industrial capitalism, whereas Lacan was facing the rise of finance based early neoliberal consumer based capitalism. And that version of capitalism Lacan was facing was one which was um, disproving the efficacy of the Freudian Oedipus complex in some ways. Right. And, um, and that's why Lacan tries to invent new solutions to this. And also why Lacan could be perceived 
as reactionary to like people like Deleuze and Guattari because he's again saying, look, all I'm doing is teaching you what Freud taught us. And yeah, so if right. I am reactionary, perhaps my reactionary basis is a result of changing historical conditions that we're dealing from Freud's time to now in some sense. So uh, because somebody's asking about Felix uh, Guattari, and I, I don't know what your question is specifically, Sajid, about Guattari, but I suppose that the issue with him and with Deleuze as well is like that we should ask ourselves is what's the legacy of the anti-Oedipal project? I always like to start at the most practical level and ask yeah. like what what did their critique of Lacanianism produce? And that actually might be an interesting question for you, Jensen, as somebody who's writing a critique of Lacanianism in recognition of the fact that I'm assuming you, you're not interested in the same approach to Philos. No. You know, kind of anti-Hegelian, accelerationist no. approach, which is very focused on counterculture leftism, right? Um, I don't know how familiar you are with Deleuze and Guattari. I, I myself have you know, studied their work. I find it really hard to, to work through but also at times very rewarding um, because they do. I have a basic engagement with, uh, I mean, for instance, I, I have a, um, in my uh, work on Kafka, I work through the Deleuze and Guattari's work on Kafka, but mm -hmm. that's sort of the, you know, extent of my, um, so the system has refracted to, you know, those sorts mm -hmm. of smaller works. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, in some sense, what they, what they want to assault is, is all instantiations of this, um, of this metaphysical conception of the unconscious, which produces these uh, subjects of guilt, right? And so right. They, they they take that on full full on, and um, I I think that we we have to critically the, the text remains the whole anti Oedipal series. I mean, I I will never forget. I quote this in my book. Bernard Stiegler did an interview with Deleuze in the early 90s before Deleuze died and asked him, what do you think about the legacy of anti-Oedipus? And Deleuze said something very interesting. He said, I think the concepts that we created, you know, the whole Nietzschean thing of inventing concepts, right? Uh, have proven to be abused by what he calls ultra liberalism. Right. Which fascinates me that Deleuze had the humility to say that, right? It's like your life's work. And then you say, well, wait, because Lukács always has this very interesting thing that he said once where he said, uh, and I don't know if I agree with it in Destruction of Reason, the merit of a piece of art or even a philosophical concept can be gauged on the basis by which reactionaries are able to use it or not. <laughs> and he said something about how yeah. Bach, like Bach, could never be appropriated by the Nazis, something like that. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if I agree with his argument, but nonetheless, it's sort of it's sort of related, right? Which is um, wh what what has accelerationism done for us, right? Uh, practically speaking, and I think that the record shows that that it's been quite problematic. So, so I don't know. Uh, you know, people need to think hard where they land on some of these more philosophical positions, the position on castration, the position on lack, uh, which Deleuze and Guattari are trying to create schizoanalysis, which is, which is fundamentally beyond all of that, which is trying to form a mode of therapy, which is uh, not reproducing this kind of subjectivity for which, yeah. you know, whatever. Uh, but the, the challenge with that also is that there's not schizoanalytic clinics. So like we don't have the empirical results of what the Lusian Guattarianism might be because it yeah. doesn't really we know what Lacanianism is and right now Lacanianism is actually really liberal reactionary a lot of it is um in, in right mind, right yeah no and I, I mean I think that the again this is sort of refracted through literary examples but I mean you know like in the their uh Deleuze and Guattari's their reading of both Kafka's The Trial and um, The Metamorphosis, I mean, the claim is that in the case of The Trial, that really what the, all of the sort of readings of the novel about like guilt before the law and, you know, some kind of, um, uh, you know, that the, that the K figure is, is living in this sort of permanent state of, you know, uh, a constitutive state of, um, 
uh, fallenness or guilt owing to his assumption into the law. They want to say that, no, 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 this is wrong. Actually, like what you see is that Cage is fully coincides with the law to the point where there is no longer guilt anymore. Uh, you just have, you know, a total identity between desire and the law, because it's only when there's a conflict between desire and the law that, you know, there's any sort of tension or determinacy or negativity. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of like the metamorphosis, for instance, they say that like, well, this is, you know, when Gregor Samsa turns into the, the, the bug at the beginning of the story, like th this is the moment in Kafka where you really have this sort of um, profound overcoming of the Oedipal family. Mm -hmm. like you finally achieved uh, mm -hmm. something that lies completely outside of the Oedipal triangle. Mm -hmm. But then there's a scene later in the, the, in the, uh, the story when, you know, um, the, the father throws an apple at Gregor Samsa's back and it makes a wound in his, you know, insect like back. And Deleuze and Guattari say, this is Kafka's big failure because in this moment, by creating this wound, he's reinitiated Samsa into the Oedipal circle. And, you know, this is precisely what mm -hmm. it was his like literary mm -hmm. brilliance to have just escaped. So for them, you know, it's all about sort of, uh, I mean, to put it crudely and to use sort of the, the term you used earlier, I mean, it is kind of a, you know, like a romantic anti-capitalism in my view, or, you know, I mm -hmm. think that's in some ways what it boils down to. Yeah. I mean, I think it's been extremely, inf like um, Andrew Ryder has a great analysis of Guattari's early Trotskyist affinities and how Deleuze and Guattari and their thought, I mean, has been um, hugely influential, actually, on the alter globalization left. I mean, Lula studied with Guattari, right? Like, but, you know, like, for me, like, I think we need to be very good students of of of, of revolutionary history and, and kind of recognize moments in which um, we face an op opening of a new conjecture. And and I, I'm 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 of the opinion that we should be quite um critical perhaps of 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 what the Les Guattari's project has has resulted in with full recognition that because you know one of the things they were trying to do was come up with a substitute for the proletariat yeah right in yeah. putting forward what they called the the figures of of minor subjectivity yeah. now when we look at the left today i think that has been wildly successful so successful that it goes back to Deleuze's whole point that like it was almost in a sense co-opted and even in bed Jew, you also get this notion of substitutes for the for the for the for the classical pro proletariat. And I'm sorry, but I am at the of the mind now, as a person of the left, that like, well, uh, well, I don't know. Like maybe maybe we don't maybe we need to to go back to a more classical conception of proletariat, without any of this notion that this is going to be some like um, fascistic thing or some kind of like. You know, well, this is what, this is what, thing, right? Right. This is what William Clare Roberts is also arguing for recently. I mean, in his uh, recent review of the uh, the class matrix, with the Chibber, I mean, he, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he has the same critique of Lukash that Lukash's distinction between, you know, imputed consciousness and empirical consciousness vis-a-vis -vis the proletariat is a moralizing notion, mm -hmm. and that the whole idea of proletarian class standpoint is a kind of Marxist moralism that we need to throw out. Mm -hmm. And what, what do you think that that's what do you think? I think that that's completely disastrous. Uh, that, you know, if you ditch the idea of the standpoint of the proletariat, then you've effectively erased any uh, sort of historically grounded standpoint of critique. And, you know, the, the idea of the proletariat as, um, you know, both the sort of capitalist constituting class uh, or capital constituting class uh, that in itself is important um, both to grasp the structure of capital but also politically um, you know one has to see that the very possibility of an imminent critique of capitalism is you know grounded in the notion of the proletariat as um, you know the sort of uh, self-negating class of capitalist society Mm -hmm. I mean, this is Marx's original point going back to the 1840s. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that it's also, uh, 
you know, and it's very much part of the project that we we have to retain if we want to retain Marxism at all. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think the challenge is to perform a kind of dialogue internal to the left about what the definition of standpoint of proletariat is, understanding full well all of the water that has gone under the bridge since the invention of this proposition, which was... 200 years ago by Lukács. I was so 100, 100 years ago, exactly, uh, in history and class consciousness in some sense. Well, That's obviously right. Marx too, but Lukács gives us more resources in some ways to, to do right. this. Yeah. Um, and to, to put forward a conception of standpoint of proletariat, which would not be um, sort of creating alarm bells of reaction and contestation like that, that we often get in these debates. Um, where everything is about oh well what about race and class and like what sort of you sort of you know there's a tendency to channel things everything this kind of american liberal context yeah. which which is like not the right context to to debate the issue or even look at the issue yeah. um i know that uh mine i think mine is how you say your name veldman as a question on nietzsche i would just say the connection of nietzsche to freud is is interesting because um yeah nietzsche definitely i mean freud famously says i refuse to study Nietzsche in depth because I don't want to, because uh, we're too close. I don't want to like run the risk of like uh, plagiarizing him in some way, uh, which is an interesting thing, like anxiety of influence, Harold Bloom avoidance, right? But, right? but nonetheless, I would say this, I would say, you know, Freud is for the intensification of the rationalist tradition in his understanding of the unconscious, whereas Nietzsche is a great opponent to to rationalism in some sense, right? For which he he locates rationalism um, in Socratism and all of its and Rousseauism and all of its various instantiations as as both a metaphysical and a political threat, right? So yeah. so so in Nietzsche, one gets uh, a much more um, anti-rationalist uh, uh, view on the drives. Um, of course, that's no surprise that Jung would be way more Nietzschean uh, than would Freud. Uh, I think that's very important to note that difference. And again, I think Lukács really helps us understand that Jung's whole theory of initiation is of his school is based on an aristocratic epistemology, as Lukács calls it. And it is. Right. And right. that's and that's and that's Nietzschean, I'm sorry to say. Um, but the Lozen Guatri also have a Nietzschean thing because Nietzsche has many different um, sort of masks, uh, which we could talk about on another, another, I don't, are you a, s a scholar of Nietzsche at all, Jensen? Do you study Nietzsche much? Uh, here and there. I mean, I, I have a, uh, in my book, I have a, um, a chapter on uh, actually the beautiful soul and Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain, mm. um, which is, uh, I mean, Mann was extremely influenced um, by Nietzsche and the, the mm -hmm. phrase uh, Salbeberg or Magic Mountain comes yeah. from um, the birth of tragedy. Uh, so I've, I've engaged Nietzsche through that and I have some on Nietzsche in the book, um, mm -hmm. but it's not a huge part of my, uh, you know, sort yeah. of uh, canon. Yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's helpful. I know that um, Stephen Holgate has uh, written a book from a philosophical standpoint that is on um, Hegel and Nietzsche, which I understand is is the finest, I haven't yet read it, but it's the finest sort of statement on, you know, 19th century uh, philosophy vis-a-vis -vis Nietzsche and Hegel. Um, that's on that's on my list, because right now I'm writing a book on Nietzsche's politics. Um, I see. Which is, which is different than his metaphysics. I mean, Nietzsche is so vast, right? Right. So I'm, I'm being pretty, 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 pretty localized there. Yeah, I mean, not to, you know, continue to sing the praises of Robert Pippin, but Pippin's work on Nietzsche, I think, is also, um, you know, uh, brilliant, um, in, in part because, um, you know, Pippin is out to sort of show that the anti-rationalist picture of Nietzsche is a little bit overblown, and he tries to develop um, sort of a theory of action uh, via Nietzsche that is much closer to Hegel's. Um, and, you know, I find, I find that work, uh, very valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll check it out. I, um, I will admit I, I was turned off from Pippin just in part because of his liberal politics, but I come to learn that he, 
um, was kind of a new left uh, socialist in a way, but but kind of so like, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to put too much of an onus on what his personal politics are, but those things do matter to me. Um, yeah. Uh, did you study with him yourself or? Uh, not formally, but we've had a sort of informal dialogue for mm -hmm. a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think politically Pippin was active, uh, you know, in his college years, I don't know the full story, but, um, when he was at, I think Trinity in Connecticut, maybe he was part of like, uh, the SDS or, That's right. That's um, right. yeah. Um, so he yeah, was on, there, he was on sublation, talked about that. And that was pretty impressive to me. That was pretty cool. I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but Pippin is, you know, I mean, in recent years, he's come more and more to sort of, uh, I think, accept that capitalism is a basic organizing category for mm -hmm. how we have to think about modernity. But mm -hmm. I still don't think that he's fully ever confronted Marx and, you know, Marx's um, sort of critical theory of modernity. And I think that that's one of the major um and, and I, I don't know if, if you know this, but um, I mean, recently Pippin has become increasingly sympathetic to he Heidegger. And his next book is actually on, on Heidegger, um, in which, um, from what I understand, Pippin is actually going to argue that um, he thinks that Heidegger's chief objections to Kant and Hegel, which Pippin has been, you know, defending them against for 40 years, uh, he now thinks that they're basically right. Um, well, well, and that's a pretty profound, uh, you know, shift. So, uh oh, yikes! Yeah, Richard Rorty once said something funny. He said that um, philosophers can develop uh, what he called Heidegger ass, which is when they when they stand up, their ass is completely flat because they've just been sitting and reading Heidegger all day. <laughs> Yeah, the same could be true for Hegel. I guess Hegel's yeah. probably has more written than yeah. Heidegger. Um, but I do think it's a political symptom. I don't think it's just sort of an arbitrary shift, but I, I think it comes from a, a moment of, you know, both recognizing, you know, capitalism as uh, I see what you mean. overriding category of modernity, but also not having the sort of emancipatory resources to, you know, offer a Sorry, there's an ambulance yeah. going by. Uh, so your first, your first intuition is to to reject this move that he's making. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's um, yeah that there's certain conceptual resources that one would need to be able to process the kind of despair. I think that's prompting the, you know, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it an anti-rationalist turn, but he's published a couple of pieces recently on anti-idealism. Mm -hmm. and basically claim that, you know, yeah, that Heidegger has a certain critique of Hegel's logic and Heidegger has a, you know, critique of Hegel's concept of logical life. And um, yeah, that, that Hegel is overly rationalist and Heidegger catches something that, that Hegel misses, um, you know, about uh, the sort of primacy of uh, experience over logos and, um, you know, the primacy of being over determinacy in the logic context. And um, yeah, I think that these are sort of symptomatic expressions of uh, undigested Marxism, to put it simply. In other words, in other words, there's a choice between Marx and Heidegger, ultimately, when one is a Hegelian, and yeah. one must choose Marx over Heidegger in some sense for you. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Because Marx, Marx gives that those missing elements you just listed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, yeah. If you want to, if you want to complete the Hegelian project, if you want to be a Hegelian, you actually have to become a Marxist. That's the thought. And Pippin well, this was, has, just, yeah. There, this was Engels. No this is what Engels. This Engels said that actually happened in um, in Ludwig Feuerbach in the end of classical German philosophy, which I mean, right. I love that argument of Engels. But a lot of scholars laugh at it, um, you know, where he says the the project of understanding bourgeois social life, as Hegel put put it forward um, after 1848, slowly started to dissolve and, and within the bourgeois academy. And then it was left up to the workers movement to truly continue it. Right. When I hear that, it like makes my like skin like it makes me so happy to hear this. Like, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Right. Um, yeah. 
there's no better example of like um of um of 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 what Marx says of like um the the that philosophy and the the heart of philosophy is the proletariat. That's exactly yeah. it. well, it's actually an empirical claim that Engels is making. Uh and Lukács follows him there, right? I yeah, mean, no, and, and so does Karl Korsch and Marx yeah. and philosophy. Yeah. I and mean, this is the same sort of well, what's your what's your take on that? Do do you because everybody hates that argument, but like for me, like it's 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 great that the proletariat is the inheritor of the tradition of german idealism that sort of argument yeah, yeah i mean i think that it's uh it's totally right that if the um yeah that, that hegel's own account of you know freedom is realized in modern ethical life and you know something resembling the modern bourgeois state in his you know constitutional monarchical form um that you know we recognize that 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 is a sort of failure, that Hegel's own notion of universal freedom remains unrealized in the context in which he thought that it was realized. And that ultimately the critical theory that Marx gives us of you know, capitalist modernity, that positions the proletariat as uh, basically the, the, the true agent of the realization of Hegelian freedom, of mm -hmm. universal freedom. So I think that that's um, exactly right. I mean, there's a more complicated question about the post history of that and what's happened since and where mm -hmm. the proletariat is now. Yeah. Um, and we have to account for that absence. Um, but I still think that that point, you know, if there's ever going to be an emancipated society, it will have to be grounded in that insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do a program in the future on that question, because I feel like um, there's there's two things. There's the the kind of limited period of the second international, and then there's the kind of intervening war periods in which Engels's hypothesis, which goes from like yeah, like shortly after 1848 up to like 1914, yeah. could have could have some empirical historical validity to it. Right. But then I think a lot of people want to say, oh well, everything everything mutated so drastically and so on and so on. But the point yeah. is to the point is to 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 resurrect this. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's 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 a normative horizon, even if you know empirically, like what the proletariat realizing history or came to mean under Stalinism was something grossly distorted. I think that the normative horizon of the proletariat as the agent of the realization of universal yes. freedom yeah. that must continue to task us if we're going to be Marxist at all. Otherwise we might as well just throw it away and go home. Absolutely. On that, on that point, my friend, I think we will close our session. Sure. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Uh, hopefully we got to the comments. Thanks for watching. And we'll be back uh, later this week for a great program on Adorno and ideology. So stay tuned for that. And Jensen, we must have you back on at some point in the future. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. Really appreciated it. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Take care, everybody.